Kicking things off, in at number 10, we have the Mega Mouth Shark. Don't be fooled by its name, these sharks are a lot less sinister than they sound. Measuring in at an average of 25 feet, this shark was only first discovered back in 1976 near Oahu, Hawaii, and since its discovery, there have only been a hundred other sightings of this scary looking creature. They are filter feeders, which means they slowly swim through the water with their mouths open to feed on plankton. They also like to alternate between deep and shallow water and search for food, but because they have only been a hundred sightings of this mega mouth shark, there is still a lot of information about their lifestyle and feeding habits that still need to be discovered. But honestly, who named this shark? They must be the least creative person on the planet. They literally saw that it had an unusually like large mouth and decided that it would be called, um, what should we call this thing? The, the Mega Mouth? Uh, the Big Mouth? Now we're going, we're going with Mega Mouth Shark. Well, thank you for that one, Captain Obvious. Well, number nine, we have the Tiger Shark, who measures in at 25 feet, weighing in at about 1,300 pounds. The Tiger Shark are known to have one of the most bizarre diets. They will eat anything from albatrosses, venomous snakes, and other sharks to garbage such as paint cans, rubber tires, and even license plates. They definitely aren't picky eaters. I know I'm pretty picky. I don't like a lot of foods. And yeah, take a look at their scary teeth. Aside from being a razor sharp and slanted, they serve a dual purpose. First, these sharp teeth help the shark to grab onto the struggling victims, and then they allow the tiger shark to rip through their skin and hides with ease. So they can literally go after just about any prey that crosses their path. And take a look at this gigantic tiger shark that was caught by two fishermen over near the Australian coast. This particular shark measured in at six meters and the fishermen said that originally they had a hammerhead on their line, but then this tiger shark came out of nowhere and swallowed the hammerhead shark. I bet he instantly regretted that decision because now he's dead. But how the heck did they pull this gigantic shark into their boat? And why would they want to invite that thing on? On board. You know what? There are so many things in the water that are just so scary, it makes me not want to swim in the open oceans. Next up, number eight, we have the Kratoxy Rhina. This ferocious looking shark measures in at 25 feet long and weighs a whopping 1,000 to 2,000 pounds. The Kratoxy Rhina shared the oceans with the marine dinosaurs, and that dates back 75 to 100 million years ago, but they were still known to be the ultimate predator found in the water. The Plesiosaurus, Tylosaurus, and the largest turtle were all all easy preys for the shark, even though they were all bigger than him. This shark is also known for its 490 razor sharp teeth, and each one of his teeth were capable of growing up to seven centimeters long. Is this real life right now? It is also a common fact that the Kretoxy rhino shark established sharks as the dominant oceanic predator. My only question is, why hasn't Hollywood made a movie on this shark yet? I mean, they've made all these shark movies already, and I'm pretty sure a shark movie just came out. So you know what, I think it's time to call um, Steven Spielberg, you there? Great White Sharks makes its way onto this list at number seven. Great White Sharks have a really notorious reputation with humans, and this is the shark that we probably fear the most. Thanks to movies like Jaws, Jaws 2, Jaws 3, Jaws 4, Jaws 5, I, I don't know how far they go. But still that doesn't stop people from having an irrational fear of these scary looking sharks. Great Whites can grow to be around 26.2 feet long and they can swim at speeds of up to 60 kilometers an hour. Currently they are the largest predatory fish that exist on our planet. So I get why so many people are so scared of them. Great White Sharks are also equipped with a set of 300 razor shark triangular teeth that are arranged in seven rows. Okay, now I'm officially terrified, but wait, there is a more. Let me introduce you guys to Deep Blue. He is the largest great white shark that currently exists today. He weighs in at 2.5 tons and measures around 20 feet long, but take a look at these pictures right here. This is absolutely terrifying and I have no idea what these divers are thinking. I would be peeing in the ocean if I ever saw these things swim near me, and I'm hoping that it startles them. It scares them away. I don't I don't know what I'm hoping for, but I don't think I'm ever going to be in that situation. Swimming at number six, we're talking about the auto dust shark. Things are about to get serious on this list because this shark measures in, and I kid you not, at 30 feet. How is this even possible? Well, for comparison, that's the size of an NFL goalpost. The auto dust shark dominated the oceans during the Paleocene and also the Eocene period, which was roughly, um, 
about 45 to 60 million years ago. So don't worry, these sharks won't be snacking on your legs when you swim. They are also known to be direct ancestors to the massive Megalodon, who appears later on in this list. And is the Megalodon still around? They had similar feeding habits and their teeth grew to about three to four inches and they mainly feasted on whales. Let's just say that I'm extremely happy that these sharks are no longer alive today. Waiting into this list of number five, we have the Tichodus shark who measures in at 30 feet long. Also known as the Crusher Shark, because why not? This beast of a thing roamed the oceans 85 to 100 million years ago, and they enjoyed feeding on shellfish because they can easily crush their shells with their powerful jaws. If you were to look inside of their mouth, you would see that they have 550 massive flattened teeth, and paleontologists believe that their teeth can grow up to 55 centimeters long and 45 centimeters wide. That sounds absolutely terrifying if you ask me. Any creature that is capable of ripping me apart limb from limb is an enemy of mine in my books. I'm really starting to develop an irrational fear of sharks. Is anyone else feeling the same way? Or is it just me? Okay, let's, I think it's just me. No, I think a lot of you guys are afraid of sharks. Number four, we have the Helicorpion Shark. You know the shark with like the, the teeth like that? Well, you guys are looking at the picture now and yeah, are you guys even prepared to have your life ruined right now? Well, thank God this scary looking beast went extinct 250 to 290 million years ago. I don't even know how we know things like that. Well, otherwise we would be in a whole lot of trouble if they were still alive today. The name Helicorpion literally means a spiral saw. So it kind of makes sense. And paleontologists all agree that these crazy looking teeth were attached to his his lower jaw. The helicorpion was estimated to grow up to 30 feet long, so it seems like our last few sharks are all 30 feet. Why can't anyone grow just a little bit longer than that? Well, one of the most interesting facts about the shark is that they were able to survive the Permian-Triassic extinction event, which killed 90% of all marine animals and 70% of all land animals. But as fate would have it, the helicorpion's luck ran out when it went extinct several million years later. But who knows, maybe this species is still hiding in the deep sea waiting to resurface again. The 40 foot basking shark makes its way onto this list at number three. Well, despite their large mouths and extremely threatening appearance, basking sharks are actually not aggressive at all. And they are completely harmless to divers and snorkelers. I mean, I was literally about to burn all my swim trunks. Well, as it turns out, they use their large mouths to capture plankton and they also use their hook-like teeth to help them catch more plankton. So you're telling me that these sharks just swim around all day with their mouths open and that's all they have to do? Sounds super lazy if you ask me, but I also have the feeling that, you know what? They're kind of winning at life, aren't they? But I'm pretty sure if I saw this thing while snorkeling, I would instantly have a heart attack I mean, just look at that thing. Number two, we're talking about the whale shark. I mean, what the heck is this? Whale meets shark and they infuse to create this master Okay, I don't know. Well, currently whale sharks are the largest fish on the planet, measuring at 46. This is crazy. 46 feet and weighing up to 12 tons. Whale sharks are known to be filter feeders, which means that they enjoy eating plankton through their gills, but they also like to eat squid krill and other small fish. Even though they're not threatening to humans, they still look pretty terrifying. They have about 3,000 tiny teeth, but thankfully they don't use these teeth to eat. If you're brave enough, you can actually pay to swim alongside whale sharks, but like anything in nature, nothing is predictable and there's no guarantees that you won't be hurt while swimming with these giant beasts. And finally, coming in at number one on our list, we have the Megalodon. It's no surprise. It was an obvious number one for this one. This 50 foot monster was the largest predatory fish of all time. Everything about this shark has kept our fear of the ocean alive. Despite the fact that the Megalodon has been dead, well, dead, is it, is it dead? For over 2.6 million years. They probably weighed over 48 tons and their teeth ranged from about three to seven inches in length. Their jaws measured measured in at seven feet tall by six feet wide, and they had a bite force of about 40,000 pounds per square inch. If that's not terrifying enough, Megalodon sharks ate whales for breakfast because they had to consume about one ton of food per day in order to sustain itself. Oh, and uh, yeah, I, I forgot to mention that this thing also had about 276 teeth. So I guess we could take comfort in the fact that they're no longer alive, but since only 5% of our world's oceans have been explored, I mean, who knows? Who knows what kind of scary creatures are actually lurking in the ocean? Also, who knows? Maybe these creatures will develop a craving 
for humans. Starting off our list in our number 10 spot, we have the Maui Saurus. These guys are a creature that was once very real, but they are thankfully a relic of our past because they are absolutely horrifying. They are named after the Maori god Maui, who is said to have pulled the islands of New Zealand up from the sea floor, so anything named after him is of course going to be an absolute ginormous beast. The neck of this creature measured around 49 feet long, which is the longest proportionate neck of any animal ever. The entire creature Creature measured around 66 feet, so it's clear that their neck counted for a large portion of their body. But like, imagine a swimming dinosaur creature with a snake for a neck. That's kind of what these guys were like. These guys lived on Earth during the Cretaceous period, which is good news for us, but not so much for the other creatures that lived at the time. Creatures would jump into the water to avoid a T-Rex only to find this guy waiting for them. Yeah. No thank you. In our number 9 spot today we have SCP-169. SCP-169 is a bit of an enigma because it is said that it cannot and will never be contained. There is no structure on earth large or strong enough to hold SCP-169 and while the exact location of it is currently unknown, satellite images suggest that it is located in the southern Atlantic Ocean. SCP-169 is said to be a marine arthropod of massive size and is often referred to as Leviathan. At first it was presumed that the tales were just myths, but during investigations of supposed paranormal activity, its existence became feared. The creature is estimated to have a body length of somewhere from 2,000 to 8,000 kilometers, and it is thought to have existed since the pre-Cambrian era. As far as we know, this single specimen is the only of its kind, and next to nothing is known about its lifestyle. The creature moves quite slowly at a pace of less than one kilometer per week, but it is currently believed that it is just a drift. In the area that is believed to be the current location of the creature, there have been regular seismic tremors detected, and this is thought to be indicative of SCP-169's breathing. These tremors cause minor shifts in the island's terrain, so it is believed that the creature is currently dormant. In our number 8 spot today we have the Paku. The Paku is a name that refers to several species of fish that actually do exist here on earth, and they belong to the family of fish that are related to piranhas. There is one reason why these guys freak me out and make me feel like they are from another universe and that is because they have teeth that literally look like a humans teeth. As relatives of the piranha, you would think that they would have those same razor sharp teeth and the underbite, but that is simply just not the case. In a positive turn of events however, despite their aggressive cousin and their creepy teeth, they mostly feed on plant material instead of flesh and scales, so while they are super uncomfortable to look at, they are not a worry to us at all. What if these fish have weird teeth because they came from a universe where fish have human teeth and humans have fish teeth? How do we know that there is no parallel universe where that exists? We don't. In our number 7 spot today we have SCP-3000. The area where SCP-3000 currently resides is a region in the Bay of Bengal that is around 300 kilometers in diameter. Because of the creature, any kind of deep sea diving by civilians is strictly prohibited because if any contact is made, the humans will need to be immediately contained, quarantined and processed for an indefinite amount of time. So what is SCP-3000? Well, it is a massive aquatic serpentine creature that resembles the giant moray eel. This one is a mostly sedentary creature which may be due to its incredibly large size. While its exact measurements are unknown, it is believed to measure somewhere between 600 to 900 kilometers in length. This creature is carnivorous and although it stays in one spot most of the time, that doesn't mean it doesn't have the ability to quickly snap up its prey. It is said that any direct observation or even individuals within a certain distance Distance of SCP-3000 will experience inexplicable head pain, paranoia, fear, panic and memory loss or altercation. All of this being said, I think it's probably just safe to stay far, far away from this one. In our number 6 spot today we have the blobfish. I have spoken about the blobfish before and I will again until they get the justice that they deserve. We've all seen a picture of a blobfish at some point or another, they're that fish that looks like a blob, or they kind of look like that coworker you don't really like, or the person in class who reminds the teacher that there was homework. I'm getting a little carried away, but you catch my drift. 
They aren't cute, and they were even voted world's ugliest animal, and while I understand why, I think the blobfish is a little misunderstood at the moment. These guys like to make their home deep in the ocean, somewhere from 2,000 to 4,000 feet, where the water pressure is much greater than it is up here. If we tried to visit the natural habitat of the blobfish, we would need some heavy duty equipment to keep ourselves safe, because our human bodies do not like that kind of pressure. So applying this same logic, the blobfish fish needs the same kind of protection if it were to come to the surface. Or better yet, we could just leave them alone to live in their little deep sea lives. While in its natural pressure filled habitat, the blobfish looks like a normal deep sea fish, when it is forced to the surface they turn into these blob looking guys that we've all been making fun of. I guess what I'm trying to say is that, yeah, okay, these guys are from our earth, but they're basically from the parallel universe that we call the deep sea. In our number 5 spot today we have SCP-835. This creature is a large mass of coral like polyps with each individual polyp being larger than any known coral species. Some have been measured to have grown over a meter in diameter. SCP-835 has a central mass that is roughly shaped like an oval, with a polyp at each end. While this creature is unable to move around the deep sea, they appear to anchor themselves down by their large tentacles that come off of the polyps. The tentacles not only anchor the creature, but they also help in the feeding process, and they are coated with a sticky adhesive substance. This creature has an extremely hard outer shell, which means that diamond drills have been needed in order to help collect even the smallest samples of the specimens. This creature has the ability to secrete a pretty toxic batch of chemicals, parasites, Sites and bacteria, so the idea of completely cracking one open is not something that is currently an option out of fear. SCP-835 also has the ability to grow at an incredibly fast rate, but it can also slow its own growth, even sometimes halting it for a full 24 hours. In our number 4 spot today we have the Helicoprion. This is the weirdest looking sea creature I've ever seen and I am so glad it does not exist anymore. This is a creature that once swam in our oceans long before any of us were around. These creatures were like sharks and they grew to be around 15 feet long. Their lower jaw consisted of a tooth whorl which makes them literally look like a cross between a shark and a circular saw. Jaws just got a whole lot more terrifying. The fossils found of these creatures have shown us that their teeth were serrated so they most definitely were carnivores, but there has been debate about the exact placement of the teeth within the mouth. Does it matter that much though? A shark combined with a power tool is a bad combo no matter what. These animals were able to survive the Permian Triassic extinction though, which is a clear testament to their survival capabilities, and this might also mean that they lived extremely deep in our oceans. In our number 3 spot today we have SC SCP-3934 SCP-3934 is a species of amphibious reptiles that see the males growing to be 1.9 meters on average and the females growing to be 1.7 meters. These guys are omnivorous and like to snack on fish and aquatic flora. This species was first created in the early 20th century with the intent to sell them as exotic pets and while the exact circumstances surrounding their creation is unknown, it has been confirmed that some share almost identical skeletons structures with historical plesiosaurs. These guys were part of a whole marketing campaign to make them one of the most desired pets, and that just may be where the whole Loch Ness Monster thing comes from. SCP-3934 are very social animals and they love to interact with humans as well. While being created, it is said that their behavior patterns were modeled after Labrador retrievers, so it is obvious that this species also makes a great best friend for man. I mean, aside from the whole we don't live in the water thing. Unfortunately, despite the intentions, they don't make great pets as they have a specialized diet and habitat requirements that are not easily met, and this led to a vast majority of the specimens either passing away or being abandoned by those who once owned them. In our number 2 spot today we have Leviathan Melvilli. These guys were a kind of whale that existed at the same time as the Megalodon, so of course this means that they had to be quite a strong contender to match up to the Earth's largest predator predatory shark to ever exist. Their name of course comes from the leviathan, and I can totally understand why. These are the whales that ate other whales for food. We know how large whales can be so that is absolutely insane. These guys had the largest teeth of any animal that uses their teeth to eat. I said that like that because something like an elephant's tusk is technically larger, but elephants don't use those to eat. And they also don't eat whales, so 
there's that. These guys had heads that were 10 feet long and they had the same echolocation abilities as whales today have, which makes them even better and more adapted predators. Like having teeth 1.2 feet long wasn't enough, they also needed to have a few special skills. While blue whales are currently our largest animal on earth, I don't think they would have been able to stand up to these prehistoric whales. In our number one spot today we have SCP-1128. This SCP is a little different than the other ones on today's list and that is because it is more of an etheric entity. This creature has the ability to manifest itself as an enormous aquatic predator, but only to those who have been given its full description of the appearance, so I'll try to refrain from doing that today. People who have been infected by the creature won't really show any symptoms or abnormal behavior, but it is possible that they might show extreme aversion to going into the water. If an infected person enters the water and is fully submerged, no matter the depth, they will completely disappear underneath the surface of the water. Some of the time they will reappear a few moments later in a state of total panic, frantically trying to get out of the water, but other times instead of reappearing above the water, you'll instead see blood and debris cloud the water, with the debris later being able to be confirmed as the vanished person. The lucky ones who have survived have explained that while they had vanished, they were transported to the vast ocean where they were actively being pursued by SCP-1128. I don't know about you guys, but I don't ever want to encounter SCP-1128. Number 10. Cursed Tablet. We'll kick this list off with a super recent discovery, small but mighty. This tablet comes in at just 2 centimeters by 2 centimeters. Little <laughs> Discovered only a couple of weeks ago in the West Bank, this artifact has historians scratching their heads because it's a couple hundred years older than any Hebrew texts. Yeah, it predates the Dead Sea Scrolls by 1,350 years. The ancient letters mean to call God onto anybody who breaks this curse. So yeah, hot start for this one. There's around 40 proto-alphabetic letters, early Hebrew writing all folded onto this little lead tablet piece. Now the fact that this small tablet mentions the curse of Yahweh is pretty alarming. And we found it too, that's incredible. This sediment comes from excavations done in the 80s on Mount Ebal. So many believe this is from the ancient stone structure, Joshua's altar and it just made its way to us. The tablet was dated to around 1200 BC. The chemical isotopes in the tablet suggest that it's from that mountainous range in Greece, AKA the mountain of curse. Yeah, just the thing we need right now, an ancient curse from an ancient curse mountain. Nice, keep it up. Number nine, the SS Monaco. When coming across these deep sea discoveries, it's rare that we find, well, anything at all, for starters, but to find something ages ago still intact, it's beautiful. It helps us understand history, like a 90 year old shipwreck, for example. The SS Monaco was built in Glasgow back in the late 1800s, and the passenger vessel would take daily trips from Toronto to Hamilton. I know, I said deep sea curses, but this was only a year ago in Canada, so I had to talk about it, okay? It's fitting. The ship sunk due to too many passengers, but many believe a curse was behind this whole thing. The ship was apparently renamed, which in ancient seafaring traditions is bad luck. You don't want to do that. That's bad juju. You pick one name and you stick with it, you know? I'm not changing my name up. Although I kind of want to some days. Now cut to 2018, four Canadian divers located it and it's almost completely intact still. It's haunting to look at. Number eight. Mayan Caves. Back in 2018, again, recently, a diver was exploring flooded caves in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. Because apparently that's how some people spend their weekends. How fun is that? That's pretty epic. They were diving around the area and saw a peculiar opening and then went in. Yeah, have you ever accidentally discovered one of the largest underwater cave systems in the world? No? Well, get new hobbies, I guess. Start diving, apparently, because we're missing out. We're watching YouTube videos. This guy's exploring caves. A team of divers explored many kilometers of Mayan history without even really knowing what they were in for. National Geographic got involved and explained that these skulls, given the amount found, were more than likely involved in some sort of ancient sacrifice many, many moons ago. So many elongated skulls were found, suggesting the ancient Mayans were up to something a little darker last time these caves were occupied. A lot of ancient sacrifices going down in those caves. If curses are a real thing, I bet there's probably a few laying down there, so we should probably just stop, drop, and close up this shop. Number seven. Heracleon. Ancient cities, ancient gold, ancient shipwrecks. I mean, for sure there's gotta be ancient curses as well in this plethora of ancientness. Before it was discovered in 2001, the ancient city of Heraklion was barely mentioned in text throughout history, which is amazing. Yet somehow archaeologist Frank Gaudio found it. It was hiding in the depths seven kilometers off the coast, and it was pretty obvious that it was once an ancient city because there were, you know, 64 shipwrecks, 700 anchors, and 16 foot statues just hanging around. So yeah, ancient city for sure. One vessel was around 80 feet long. It was a classical Greek flat bottomed ship with oars on both sides and a massive sail. So it was a bit hard to find this wreckage though, seeing as it was hidden 
dead and 15 feet under the collapsed Temple of Amun. Yeah, oops. A project led by the European Institute for Underwater Archaeology poked around the area and also found a 4th century Greek funerary area. Yeah, this whole area was just haunting. Just a lot of curses here. Ancient graveyards underwater? This is where curses were born, my friend. Leave this part of history alone. Number 6. The Vasa Shipwreck Back in 1628, the Vasa sunk within 20 minutes of setting sail. That's not a good thing. That's tragic. How does this happen? It claimed the lives of 30 souls on board. The Swedish Navy launched the ship August 10th, 1628, and it was once considered a high-tech warship, even referred to once as spectacular believe it or not. So yeah, again, what happened? Well, the first rush of wind caught it off guard and the second rush completely sank it. That's how fast it was. There was even a crowd around and everything to send this mighty ship off. But the 64 bronze cannons that were installed during the rushed process of building the warship were deemed too heavy. Yeah, the lack of oxygen in the water allowed for its rediscovery to continue its story and for us to figure out what went wrong. And the vessel was built with carvings all around the king at the time, which was King Gustav II. So historical find, yes, tragic. Also, definitely yes. Humans focusing too much on naval warfare rather on if the ship can actually stay afloat. I can't tell if this is a curse or just humans being humans. Is there a difference? Number five, Burmesia Island. We can't have a list on deep sea curses and not talk about the vanishing island, of course. Burmesia sounds a lot like Bermuda, but don't get the two mixed up. If you try and book a flight for Burmesia, well, you may not even arrive at all. Your trip advisor would be like, sorry, is your auto correct off? What did you mean to say? Burmesia Island was seen on several maps throughout history. Cartographers clocked it numerous times as you would, you know, an island. This is back in the 16th century, okay? So no one really had any reason to lie, I guess. They're just like, oh, it's a spooky island. They're like, hey, ghosts don't exist. We need, we need to know where land is. No time for fooling. But in 1997, it wasn't seen during a survey. And again, 2009, when researchers went to go find this location that was once there historically, it was gone. It had vanished from the Gulf of Mexico. It was originally charted off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, and it was 80 square kilometers. That was pretty big, again. But the leading theory to its absence now was that this cartographer once upon a time may have put a fake island on the map just to spot copycats in case you want to you know copy anyone's maps do we believe that though i mean i'm 50 50. is this just another atlantis or another heracleon perhaps which island is the next to be doomed some cartographers say the island has been sunk since 1844 others say it's still moving around to this day yeah so keep your eye open for any drifting islands number four ancient Greek shipwreck. The oldest shipwreck discovered in the Black Sea, and you would never guess by looking at it. The ship is from 400 BC. It's an ancient Greek trading vessel, and it's not very large, but somehow this ship has been in great condition for over 2,400 years. Yeah, over a mile below the surface as well. So the lack of oxygen actually preserved the ship. That's why it looks like it sank, you know, a year ago, and not thousands of years ago. John Adams was the principal investigator with the Black Sea Archaeology Project, and he describes the finding as something he never thought was even possible, let alone something he'd witnessed in his lifetime. This discovery changed what we knew about ships in the ancient world. The oldest intact shipwreck known to mankind. Yeah, this won't be beat ever, I don't think. This thing is older than most curses, so yeah, had to throw it in here. Number three, the Dragon's Triangle. If you thought the Bermuda Triangle was bad, this one's worse. This triangle takes the blame for disappearing ships and planes and all that horrible stuff, but the occasional UFO sighting too, just to jazz it up. In 1945, a Mitsubishi A6M0 went missing, and the pilot's distress call said the sky was opening up. Yeah, the sky opened. What in the Spider-Man No Way Home is happening here. That's one event, just one. But 10 years later, in 1955, a Japanese ship named the Shinyo Maru lost radio contact in the same exact spot. Triangle of Doom. It didn't take long for the New York Times to coin the term the Devil Sea, which I'm sure helped this whole curse story. All these spooky triangles, are ocean currents to blame, or is there something cursed about these devilish triangles? Again, let's try changing the name up, see how Mother Earth feels, you know? Instead of calling it the Devil's Triangle, call it like the Nice Triangle, and then maybe she'll stop. Number two. Chuck Lagoon. This lagoon was Japan's main base during the war, but come 1944, the United States launched an attack in what some deem is now Japan's Pearl Harbor. This is when 60 ships were sunk and around 250 planes as well. So for 70 years, there's been a massive graveyard just sitting in the Pacific. And it wasn't until recently where we finally got a good look at these haunting artifacts from history. A photographer by the name of Super Jolly went down and did the dirty work for us. He called this shoot one of the scariest dives he's ever done in his entire life. Yeah, rightfully so. I can't even swim with goggles in my lake, let alone go somewhere. What? No way. They described the atmosphere filled with human skulls and gas masks and bullets as haunting. It was like an abandoned museum underwater. All the things that you don't want to run into while you're diving. Nobody was expecting these artifacts to be all that well preserved after all this time, but photos are even still intact too. So it's a haunting reminder of naval warfare, as are a couple of these other ones. And finally, number one, 
MV Derbyshire. This ship was twice the size of the Titanic, but James Cameron didn't make a movie about it, so many of you may not know the grim details. 42 years ago, the MV Derbyshire was the largest British registered merchant ship of all time to sink during peacetime. What makes this tragedy even more memorable was there was no distress call at all, or even wreckage found for quite a while. She was assembled back in 1976, but she was lost in 1980. She was on route from Canada to Japan. Although she was following proper ocean routes with weather routing companies, it still went down. September 15th, 1980, a search began for the missing ship and crew, but six days later, the search was called off. Nothing was found at all. The ship was declared lost, and the sister ship of the MV Derbyshire ended up sinking as well later on in 1986 due to a deck cracking problem. So the families then urged officials to search again for the MV Derbyshire, and it's a good thing they reached out. Because come 1999, the Derbyshire was found. Don't give up that look. If you ever lose something, just keep looking, even if it's, you know, a cursed haunting shipwreck. Always keep looking, I guess. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the demon. There are many stories and alleged sightings of what is now referred to as the Black Demon of Cortez, which is said to be a massive black shark seen off of Mexico's Baja coast. One story in particular regarding this elusive shark comes from a fisherman named Eric Mack. He had reported that one day while sailing, he felt his boat begin to rock, which immediately gave him the feeling something was awry. Eric was even further startled when he explained that he saw a massive towering tail sticking at least five feet out of the water. The stories of this shark are so infamous that it was even the focus of an episode of a History Channel show called Monster Quest. Maybe if there's a part two of this video, we'll talk about some more of the sightings around the demon. In our number nine spot today, we have the prehistoric monster. Back in 1959, a fisherman named Tex Geds and his friend James Gavin were boating somewhere just off of the coast of Scotland. It is said that during their time out to sea, they encountered a sea monster that neither of them had ever seen before. They described its head as being sort of turtle shaped and that it was a quote hellish monster of prehistoric times and said that it was breathing heavily through a quote large red gash of a mouth. Okay, not exactly a kind description, but definitely a bit of a terrifying one. I think it's important to bring up that we actually don't really know what megalodons look like. We have a sort of idea, but at the end of the day, we only have what, some fossils, jaws, spines, teeth. It doesn't really leave us that much to work with. While it isn't quite clear what these two men saw for sure, and it's likely that we'll never know, whatever it was definitely wasn't just the average sea creature. In our number eight spot today, we have the TikTok shark. In May of last year, someone on TikTok called Alex Albrecht, who is a marine biodiversity student as well as a musician, shared a video on the app that had people seriously shocked. The TikTok shows a massive shark lurking around the ship that Alex was on, which is said to have been just off of the coast of Massachusetts at the time. The ship was full of research students when this massive shark made its appearance, many of which either screamed or had some sort of expletive in response. Another TikTok user asked in the comments if the shark in the video is a megalodon, considering how absolutely huge the thing was. Was this an actual megalodon? Likely not, but hey, I'm not the marine biodiversity student here, so who am I to say? In our number seven spot today, we have snorkeling. Robert Pamperin and a friend, Gerald Lair, were snorkeling off of La Jolla Cove in California in 1959 when Robert was attacked by a shark. It is said to have all happened quite quickly and Gerald was alerted to the distress when he heard Robert scream. Gerald turned and saw Robert unusually high in the water and his mask was missing. At this point, Gerald dove under and this is when he realized exactly what was going on. There was a shark that had Robert in its mouth up to his waist. Unfortunately, there really wasn't much that Gerald could do to stand up to this absolutely massive shark that he described as larger than your average great white. Robert sadly did not survive the event, and by the time rescuers arrived, they were only able to locate one of his fins. In our number six spot today, we have the photographer. This is an encounter that occurred just last year in November, basically a year ago. Underwater photographer Darren Verbeck was diving off of the coast of Hawaii's Big Island Island when he saw what he thought was a school of fish. He began to get closer, I mean the whole photographer thing, and as he got closer, he started to think that what he was actually seeing was a tiger shark. He got even closer and that's when he said, quote, I kept looking at the head. I'm like, that is not a tiger shark. And it got closer and closer and it just kept getting bigger and bigger. Darren continued to get closer to the shark and estimated it to be over 15 feet, which is definitely quite large. He explained that the shark was not acting in a threatening way, so he continued to take his photos and shot as much as he could before the massive shark 
shark decided to swim away. Experts explained that the shark was likely in the area because of humpback whales, and honestly, I don't want to see the shark that could take down one of those beasts. In our number five spot today, we have Deep Blue. This shark is, in fact, not a megalodon. I'll just be honest about that, but it definitely is a more modern contender. Deep Blue is the name of a great white shark who is most definitely one of the largest ever recorded, at least in our lifetime. This colossal monster is the largest great white shark ever caught on camera by scientists. She is measured to be 20 feet long, 8 feet high, and about 2.5 tons. And while this isn't all that huge compared to her massive prehistoric cousin, it certainly is no small feat. Rumors of her existence have been spread since as far back as the 1990s, but it wasn't until 2014 that she was officially caught on camera and documented. Researchers at the time were in the midst of studying tiger sharks, but she made her grand appearance after scavenging some food from a sperm whale carcass nearby. In our number four spot today, we have the USS Indianapolis. This is a story that has been considered the worst shark attack in history, which is definitely a horrific thing to think about. In 1945, the USS Indianapolis was an unescorted US warship that was sailing in the Pacific when it was struck by a Japanese torpedo. This had no problem tearing the ship in two, which then meant that 900 sailors were now floating in the ocean waiting for rescue. Over the next five days, nearly 600 men lost their lives due to shark attacks. That's either a group of sharks or a few very very large, very hungry ones. From the survivors' accounts of what happened over the course of those days, it seemed like an absolutely nightmare situation. This is exactly why it has gone on to be called one of the worst shark attacks in history. In our number three spot today, we have Rodney Fox. Rodney Fox is a man who is thought of as one of the best spear fishermen in the world. In 1963, he was partaking in the Australian Spear Fishing Championships, which were being held just south of Adelaide, when he went through what is widely regarded as, again, one of the worst shark attacks in history. The shark he encountered bit him around the waist, which ended up puncturing his diaphragm, ripping his lungs, and crushing his rib cage. Not only this, but the attack left his organs exposed, so much so that when he finally made it back to shore, those rescuing him had to keep his wetsuit on to ensure that his insides actually stayed on the inside. Despite the fact that Rodney needed at least four hours of surgery and about 400 stitches, like many people who have had these sort of terrifying encounters, rather than shying away from sharks in the water, he leaned in. He actually became an advocate for sharks after this. He created the first underwater shark observatory and helped to dispel the rumors that sharks are bad, crazy, scaring animals that we should all fear. In our number two spot today, we have the Jersey Shore. Back in 1916, during the summer season, there were five different shark attacks that occurred over the span of 10 days that ended up in the deaths of four people. This wasn't something that had been seen before in the area, which of course left people speculating as to why this was happening. There was a heat wave in the area during the time, which likely led to more people being out, enjoying summertime sort of activities, and maybe this attracted the shark, but in the end, no one knows for sure, because no one even knows what kind of shark is responsible for the attacks in the first place. Luckily, this didn't go on to become a continuous trend, and whatever shark this was, it went on its merry way, or perhaps found another source of food, but this series of attacks definitely kept the public on edge for the weeks and months surrounding. In our number one spot today, we have Watson and the shark. For this one, we are headed all the way back to 1749 with a cabin boy named Brooke Watson. Brooke was swimming in the Havana Harbor when he had his encounter with a shark. This one grabbed him by his right foot and dragged him underwater. The shark got a second chomp on his foot before a rescue boat was able to come and save him. The sailor on the boat managed to get the shark to back off enough that they could get Brooke out of the water. Brooke lost his lower leg, but his life was saved, which is absolutely the most important part. Brooke's story is not over, however, as he went on to become a member of Parliament and eventually Lord Mayor of England. He was so proud of himself for not only surviving a shark attack, but then going on to earn this title that he commissioned famous artist John Singleton Copley to create a painting called Watson and the Shark, which detailed his terrifying encounter and probably went on to scare a ton of people at the time. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the Zuyo Maru Monster. This story is one that comes to us from 1977, and rather than an alive animal sighting, this one is actually this carcass that was found that we still aren't quite sure what it belongs to. The Zoyumaru carcass was one that was found by Japanese fishermen near New Zealand. Because it was so unique, it was taken to be analyzed, and while many have speculated that it was a basking shark, 
that has never been confirmed or proven. Considering the fact that it was definitely shark-like, but just not quite clear as to what exactly it was is definitely interesting. In our number 9 spot today we have the sea creature. Back in both 1817 as well as 1819 there was a sea creature that visited the coast of Massachusetts and it was seen by hundreds of people but no one has been able to identify what it could have been for sure. The creature was said to be around 3 feet in diameter and around 50 feet long and it is said that it moved similarly to how a whale or a dolphin might. The first sighting of this creature was when some fishermen spotted it but the real panic began as the creature started to show itself closer to shore. To this day some people swear that this was some sort of real sea monster and others believe it was just a case of mass hysteria. What do you think? In our number 8 spot today we have the prehistoric monster. Back in 1959 a fisherman named Tex Geds and his friend James Gavin were boating somewhere just off of the coast of Scotland. It is said that during their time out to sea they encountered a sea monster that neither of them had seen before. They described its head as being sort of turtle shaped and that it was a quote hellish monster of prehistoric times and said that that it was breathing heavily through a quote, large red gash of a mouth. Okay, not exactly a kind description, but definitely a bit of a terrifying one. I think it's important to bring up that we don't actually know what megalodons looked like. We have a sort of idea, but at the end of the day, we only have fossils, jaws, and spines, and that doesn't leave us that much to work with. While it isn't quite clear what these two men saw for sure, and it's likely that we'll never know, whatever it was definitely wasn't just your average sea creature. And our number seven in spot today we have Dr. Gru. When we think of the tales of sea monsters and myths, we often think of the many serpent-like creatures that just may be lurking underneath the water. This is definitely a common theme and in the 17th century there was a botanist who came up with a sort of explanation for these sea serpent sightings. It's important to note that this botanist was a very legitimate scientist who really worked to change basically everything we knew about plant anatomy, so when he came forth with this evidence and explanation, it rightfully caught people's attention. Basically, he had this specimen, which was a sample of skin that he said was from some sort of seal, but that it had a neck just as long as the rest of its body. Of course, this would explain a whole bunch of sea monster sightings, but in the end, the skin sample ended up completely disappearing, making any confirmation of the story or the animal's existence completely impossible. I know a megalodon isn't necessarily supposed to look like a seal with a long neck, but who's to say for sure that it doesn't? In our number six spot today, we have the shipwreck. Back in 1909, the French steamer La Seine was out to sea when it collided with the British India steamer the Onda. A shipwreck is never good, but this one was particularly bad as, in heavy fog, the French ship sank in just two minutes. This of course left people stranded in the water and I mean you can probably see where this is going. In the aftermath of this wreck while waiting for the rescue, there were 101 people who lost their lives from shark attacks. That's a lot of people. That is either a lot of sharks or a very few large ones. I mean, none of us were there, so it's hard to say for sure, but whatever really happened here, it's an absolutely horrifying tragedy. In our number 5 spot today, we have the kayak encounter. Ida Parker and Kristen Orr were kayaking off of the coast of Plymouth in 2014 when they encountered a shark. This is truly a nightmare scenario, and it must have been absolutely terrifying. The pair, however, had actually set off with the intention of seeing a great white shark, and while it's likely that this is exactly what they encountered, they definitely did not expect what happened next. The two had heard of rumblings of a shark in the area that had swallowed a seal in one gulp, and this is what sparked their desire to head out on this journey. While out there, however, the shark began to attack their kayaks. In the end, both of them made it out alive, and when their kayaks were recovered, one was found with a huge bite mark in it. In our number four spot today, we have the oldest shark attack. Considering the fact that the megalodon is said to have been extinct somewhere over two million years ago, even evidence that seems ancient to us is a lot more recent than what our current understanding of their timeline here on Earth would suggest. That is exactly why the discovery of what is speculated to be the world's oldest evidence of a shark attack is very interesting. This discovery came by way of a 3,000 year old human skeleton that is marked with different gashes and puncture wounds. It is said that because of the volume of wounds, it makes it slightly easier to tell the story of what happened. This is because while researchers first believed that perhaps the wounds were caused by metal weapons, this could not explain why there were so many in certain parts of the body. Another telltale sign is how this skeleton was
was discovered in Japan, which at the time of this person's life, there weren't really any metal weapons at that point in history in Japan, which ruled out this theory entirely. They were also able to rule out other terrestrial carnivores, and that's when they turned to marine life to look for some more answers. Because of the time it's been, we obviously don't know what creature was involved in this attack for sure, but with the mass amount of wounds found on the skeleton, it was likely to be something large and terrifying. In our number 3 spot today we have snorkeling. Robert Pamperin and a friend, Gerald Lair, were snorkeling off of La Jolla Cave in California in 1959 when Robert was attacked by a shark. It is said to have all happened quite quickly and Gerald was alerted to the distress when he heard Robert scream. Gerald turned and saw Robert unusually high in the water and his mask was missing. At this point, Gerald dove under and this is when he realized exactly what was going on. There was a shark that had Robert in its mouth up to his waist. Unfortunately, there was not much Gerald could do to stand up to this absolutely massive shark that he described as larger than your average great white. Robert sadly did not survive the event and by the time rescuers arrived, they were only able to locate one of his fins. In our number 2 spot today, we have the Jersey Shore. Back in 1916, during the summer season, there were 5 different shark attacks that occurred over the span of 10 days that ended up in the deaths of 4 people. This wasn't something that had been seen before in the area, which of course left people speculating as to why. There was a heat wave in the area during the time which likely led to more people being out, enjoying summertime sort of activities, and maybe this attracted the shark, but in the end, no one knows for sure, because no one even knows what kind of shark is responsible for the attacks in the first place. Luckily, this didn't go on to become a continuous trend, and whatever shark this was went on its merry way, or perhaps found another food source, or whatever, but this series of attacks definitely kept the public on edge for the weeks and months surrounding. In our number 1 spot today we have the USS Indianapolis. This is a story that has been considered the worst shark attack in history, which is definitely a horrific thing to think about. In 1945, the USS Indianapolis was an unescorted US warship that was sailing in the Pacific when it was struck by a Japanese torpedo. This had no problem tearing the ship in two, which meant that 900 sailors were now floating in the ocean waiting for rescue. Over the next 5 days, nearly 600 men lost their lives due to shark attacks. I said this about the other one that was similar to this and I'll say it again, that's either a group of sharks or a very few large, very hungry ones. From the survivors accounts of what happened over the course of those days, it seemed like an absolutely nightmare situation. This is exactly why this has gone on to be called one of the worst shark attacks in history. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the photographer. This is an encounter that occurred just last last year in November. Underwater photographer Darren Verbeck was diving off of the coast of Hawaii's Big Island when he saw what he thought was a school of fish. He began to get closer, I mean the whole photographer thing, and as he got closer he started to think that what he was actually seeing was a tiger shark. He continued to get closer and that's when he said quote, I just kept looking at the head. I'm like, that is not a tiger shark. And it got closer and closer and it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Darren continued to get closer to the the shark and estimated it to be over 15 feet, which is definitely quite large. He explained that the shark was not acting in a threatening way, so he continued to take his photos and shot as much as he could before the massive shark decided to swim away. Experts explained that the shark was likely in the area because of humpback whales, and honestly, I do not want to see the shark that could take down one of those beasts. In our number 9 spot today, we have Todd Endress. Todd Endress is actually a man who was attacked by the same shark three different times on August 28, 2007. Todd was near Marina State Park in California when the attacks occurred. The first one didn't do too much damage, but the second one was certainly much worse. He would later go on to say, spoiler alert, he survived these attacks, he would later go on to say that during this second attack, the shark skinned his back, quote, like a banana peel. Okay, Mario Kart just turned into Nightmare on Elm Street. With the third attack, the shark attempted to eat his leg, which was still attached to his body, and this is when his kind of unlikely savior came in. It was actually a group of dolphins that decided to surround Todd, which provided enough of a distraction that he was able to ride a wave back to shore. It is definitely possible that the shark could have, and it may have, eaten one of those rescue dolphins should it choose to. Once Todd was back on shore, despite having lost half of his blood, his friends were able to help him until rescue arrived, and from there, just six weeks later, he was back in the water. Sadly, Todd ended up losing his life in September of 2016 from a car crash, but it's important to note that after 
after his attack before his untimely death, he made it clear he held no grudge against his shark attacker. He said, quote, We're in his realm, not the other way around. In our number 8 spot today, we have the J Bay event finals. This shark attack is from 2015 and is one that happened on live TV, but thankfully it turned out much better than it could have. During the finals of the J Bay event, which again was being broadcast live around the world, a shark got himself a little in over his head when he decided to try and take a bite out of three time world surfing champion Mick Fanning. Mick reacted a lot more bravely than I would have and started to fight back against the shark. While this was going on, another pro surfer, Julian Wilson, paddled towards the shark in order to try and help. In the end, the safety teams came out as quickly as possible to rescue the surfers and a photographer who was also out on the water, and everyone was fine, albeit probably a little shaken up. Fights broke out on the internet over whether this was a shark attack or a shark encounter, and I mean, all that really matters is the humans and the shark are all safe at the end of the day. In our number 7 spot today, we have the strange environment. This is a shark encounter that, I'll be honest, it isn't a megalodon, but it is one that is so strange it might just show that maybe we don't really have all the answers to ocean mysteries. Scientists were really surprised and confused when they found hammerhead and silky sharks swimming near an underwater volcano in the South Pacific. This is because the waters around there would be extremely hot and they would also be really acidic. This is an extreme environment for marine life and while some species would thrive in this environment, sharks aren't really on that list, hence the confusion and bafflement of the scientists. While this isn't a confirmed megalodon sighting, it is just something that shows us that life under the sea is mysterious and new secrets are revealed to us every day. In our number 6 spot today, we have Watson and the shark. For this one, we are headed all the way back to 1749 with a cabin boy named Brooke Watson. Brooke was swimming in the Havana Harbor when he had his encounter with a shark. This one grabbed him by his right foot and dragged him under. The shark got a second chomp on his foot before a rescue boat was able to come and save him. The sailor on the boat managed to get the shark to back off enough that they could get Brooke out of the water. Brooke lost his lower leg, but his life was saved, which is absolutely the most important part. Brooke's story is not over, however, as he went on to become a member of parliament and eventually Lord Mayor of England. He was so proud of himself for not only having survived a shark attack, but then going on to earn this title that he commissioned famous artist John Singleton Copley to create a painting called Watson and the Shark, which detailed his horrifying encounter and probably went on to scare a ton of people at the time. In our number 5 spot today, we have Instagram Famous. John Braxton is a man who Instagram is definitely not very happy at, and if his video came up in your feed unsuspectingly, you might also have some words for the guy. John was 27 years old at the time of his shark encounter, and he was spearfishing at the time. During his time fishing, he had an encounter with a huge shark that ended up taking a massive bite right out of his leg. John was thankfully able to escape the shark and swim to shore, where his partner tied a tourniquet and called 911. When the ambulance arrived, John was likely in shock. I mean, I would be if I even saw a shark beside me, let alone if one bit me. So in this altered state, John took his phone out and started recording a video where he panned down to his terribly injured leg. He of course posted the video to Instagram, who later removed it, but of course not before the entire computer and phone having population got a chance to save it and reshare it at any chance possible. In our number 4 spot today, we have Breach. This is a shark encounter that truthfully, I have very little background info on, but the video really speaks for itself. This shark video was recorded in Mossel Bay and it shows this gigantic shark basically leaping out of the ocean. I mean, come on, imagine. That would be absolutely terrifying. People who are more well versed in shark behavior than I am have explained that this shark, despite how it looks, is actually not doing this to be threatening and it's not a move that would be done should it be attempting to attack something. I mean, that's not entirely true, it's actually more so used in order to try and catch fast moving prey like seals. It's relatively rare to capture a shark doing this though because it takes so much energy for it to propel itself like this. I mean, they can reach 40 miles per hour and fly 10 feet into the air out of the water. That takes some serious strength. In our number 3 spot today, we have Ahmad Hassim. Back in 2006, Ahmad and his brother were assisting lifeguards in Cape Town, South Africa, and to do this, they were helping out running different survival drills. During this one particular drill, the brother was lying in the water, pretending to be someone who needed help, and that is when a huge shark could be seen heading towards this brother that was completely unaware. Ahmad saw this and was so quick thinking, he knew that sharks are typically attracted to sound, which 
I actually didn't know, so there's a little shark trivia fact for you. So because he knew this, he started splashing around in the water. This worked, and it led to the shark leaving his brother alone, but instead, the shark now set his sights on Akhmat. It ended up grabbing him by his right leg and pulling him underwater. He was able to use his left leg to kick at the shark until it let go of him, but the shark was still able to get away with his leg below the knee. A boat was able to rush him to shore, and help arrived quickly enough to rush him to the hospital and save his life. Akhmat has not let this slow him down in the slightest, though. He has gone on to reach not only the 2008 Beijing Paralympic Games, but he won gold at the 2012 London Paralympic Games, which is absolutely incredible. He has also gone on to become a shark advocate, saying that he has, quote, a sense that sharks are in trouble, and who better to speak up for sharks than a shark attack survivor? In our number two spot today, we have Rodney Fox. Rodney Fox is a man who was thought of as one of the best spear fishermen in the world. In 1963, he was partaking in the Australian Spear Fishing Championships, which were being held just south of Adelaide, when he went through what is widely regarded as one of the worst shark attacks in history. The shark he encountered bit him around the waist, which ended up puncturing his diaphragm, ripping his lungs, and crushing his rib cage. Not only this, but the attack left his organs exposed, so much so that when he finally made it back to shore, those rescuing him had to keep his wetsuit on to ensure that his insides actually stayed on the inside. Despite the fact that Rodney needed at least four hours of surgery and about 400 stitches, like many people who have these sorts of terrifying encounters, rather than shying away from sharks and the water, he leaned in. He actually became an advocate for sharks after this. He created the first underwater shark observatory and helped to dispel the rumors that sharks are bad, crazy, scary animals that we should all fear. In our number one spot today, we have Michael Coots. Back in 1997, Michael was surfing near the coast of Hawaii when he had his shark encounter. The shark decided to attack and grabbed Michael by both of his legs. Michael has gone on to explain that once the shark had a hold on him, it began swinging him back and forth like a dog would do with a toy. That is absolutely so vivid and so horrifying to even think about. Michael was able to punch the shark into letting go of him and was able to escape to safety after the scary ordeal. Although he was lucky and happy to be alive, the shark had done enough damage that Michael ended up losing his right leg. Despite this setback, Michael was back in the water just three weeks later, already using his prosthetic leg and getting used to surfing with it so he could get right back to what he loves. Michael could be terrified of sharks now and no one would blame him, but it's the exact opposite. He swam around them and even taken selfies with them since, and has explained how much he respects them, saying, quote, Sharks are not to be feared, but are incredibly beautiful and extremely important species for the health of our oceans. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have giant tube worms. These guys were totally unknown to scientists until the discovery of the hydrothermal vents that we talked about last time. Like the vent crabs, these giant tube worms also live off of and thrive in these extreme areas. These giant tube worms feed off of the tiny bacteria that get their energy from the chemicals coming from the vent water. These giant tube worms grow to be around 8 feet or over 2 meters, and they have no mouth or digestive tract. Instead, they rely on those bacteria we just talked about to live inside of them for their food, like a wonderful symbiotic relationship. These guys can best be spotted by their bright red plume, which is used for exchanging compounds with the seawater, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide. I could talk about these guys for forever because there's so many interesting facts about them. Them, but I'll end off with just one more, and that is that the outer shell of these worms is made up of a natural substance called chitin, which is also the main component of the exoskeletons of crabs, lobsters, and shrimps. Okay, one more quickly, but I swear it's the last one. These two worms also have no eyes, but they can sense movements and vibrations, and they will retreat into their protective tubes when they feel threatened. Okay. Now I'm actually done. In our number nine spot today, we have the frogfish. Frogfish are weird looking creatures, but they are also incredible at disguising themselves. They're fairly sedentary fish and they love to find their home on the sea floor at depths of around 1,000 feet or 300 meters. They range from a few inches to a foot in length and their colors vary greatly, which is how they're able to blend in with their surroundings so easily. They actually have the ability to change their color if their environment changes, with the process taking somewhere from a few days to a few weeks. While they 
can glide through the water, they sometimes also use their fins to basically walk along the sea floor. They feed off of things like other fish and invertebrates, and on their heads they have a special modified fin that kind of resembles a fishing rod with bait on it, which they use to lure in their prey. Little does the unsuspecting prey fish know, while it thinks it's about to get a meal, it's about to become the frogfish's meal. Frogfish are able to eat prey that is much larger than themselves as they have the ability to expand their mouth cavity to 12 times its resting size, which is insane. In our number 8 spot today we have the deep sea lizardfish. Deep sea lizardfish are a small family of deep water fish who are related to the telescope fish. These guys have flat heads and curved barbed teeth and they grow up to 78 centimeters or 31 inches in length, which makes them a pretty moderately sized fish. They prefer to stay at depths of 1,600 meters or 5,200 feet, and they are actually one of the world's deepest living apex predators. These lizard fish are known to eat anything that comes their way, including other fish of their own kind. Despite the lack of light in the depths of the ocean, these guys have large eyes and pupils, and their vision is actually really important for their prey detection, as their well developed eyes allow them to see any residual or bioluminescent light. Not a lot is known about their reproduction habits, but one thing that is known is that the deep sea lizard fish have both male and female reproductive organs, which is thought to be an adaptation to low population density. In our number 7 spot today, we have the ghost shark. These guys are also commonly referred to as ratfish or spookfish, and their closest living relatives are sharks and rays, but their last common ancestor lived with them around 400 million years ago. Ghost fish were once abundant and diverse, but throughout the years that has changed greatly, and they are now mostly confined to deep water. They prefer to live around 2,600 meters or 8,500 feet deep, and they have elongated bodies with bulky heads. They grow to be around 150 centimeters or 4.9 feet, and their skeletons are made of cartilage. They don't have scales and instead have smooth skin, and they range in color from black to a sort of brownish gray color. These guys use electroreception to find their prey, which is the ability to perceive natural electric stimuli, and they also have a venomous spine in front of their dorsal fins, which acts as a form of protection for them. In our number 6 spot today, we have the long tail red snapper. These fish feature a beautiful red color, and they also have very large eyes, which help it make its home in the deep sea. These guys can grow to be 3 feet or 0.9 meters long and 30 pounds. They have a forked tail that grows larger as the fish matures, and sometimes the tips of the tails have a black or white color on the ends. It takes about 4 years for these guys to reach maturity, which is relatively long for the fish world. There are a few species of this kind of fish, and they can be found in many areas of our oceans, and they are considered a delicacy in some places and cultures. It probably isn't the Mariana Trench variety that people are eating, however, as that would be quite a costly and difficult meal to achieve. In our number 5 spot today, we have acorn worms. There are a few species of acorn worms, but one in particular finds its home in the deepest points of our seas. These acorn worms can grow up to 3 feet or just under a meter in length, and they often have brightly colored bodies. They have cilia on their underside, which are used to glide over the ocean floor albeit slowly as they travel at about 3 inches per hour. As they move along, they suck the waste from the ocean floor into their gut, and they also constantly leave a trail of feces behind them, which is a nice gross fact for you. When they are ready to move to a new feeding location, they empty their gut, and then they just drift over the bottom, and they do this with the help of an excreted balloon of mucus, so this whole point is just a double whammy of grossness. They can usually be found at depths of around 1,500 to 3,700 meters or 4,900 to 12,100 feet. In our number 4 spot today, we have basket stars. Basket stars belong to the same phylum as starfish, sea urchins, and sea cucumbers. They resemble starfish, but they have five long, slender, and flexible arms. Each one of the five arms also branches out itself repeatedly, with each branch getting thinner, which makes the final branch quite thin and usually curled at the end. The central disc of the basket star where all of the arms come off of is very distinct. While some basket stars have neatly placed arms that look amazing and beautiful, some basket stars look pretty wild and strange. Basket stars move by wiggling their arms around, and they have the ability to curl into a ball when they feel threatened. They also use their arms to catch their prey as they position themselves in the current of the water. They feed on things like krill, small crustaceans, and zooplankton. Surprisingly, these guys do have a mouth, which is located on the bottom side of their disc. 
In our number 3 spot today we have predatory tuna kate. These guys are basically like the venus flytraps of the deep sea. These invertebrates make their home anchored along the deep sea canyon walls and sea floor as they wait for their meals to drift on by. Like the flytrap when they catch a piece of prey their mouth will snap shut until they are finished digesting their meal. These guys start off life looking kind of like tadpoles and then they swim around until they find a place to land which they do upside down by secreting an adhesive to keep them in place. From here they undergo a metamorphosis and have an incredibly large change. Despite having to worry about its predators, these guys are also very picky about where they live. They need to make sure the chemicals in the water as well as the temperature of the water are just right and it's also imperative that they stay in place once they find their spot. If they're removed from the canyon wall, they unfortunately will die. The predatory tunicate may seem a little weird, but one cool thing is that they have been found to be useful in the medical world and they may even have the potential to help with conditions such as melanoma and leukemia which is absolutely incredible. In our number 2 spot today we have the deep sea hermit crab. Okay, many of us have seen or heard of a hermit crab before, so at a first thought, they aren't the weirdest thing out there, but as it turns out, the deep sea variety is quite interesting. Instead of these guys carrying around empty gastropod shells like the hermit crabs we are used to, these guys instead carry around sea anemones, and it is one of the weirdest looking things I have ever seen. It looks like these crabs are missing a pair of legs, but instead the legs have actually been adapted to hold the anemone in place. I don't know about you guys, but I really think this one looks like some sort of disgusting sea spider that I hope just stays at the deepest depths of the Mariana Trench. No offense to the crab, it's just not my cup of tea. In the number one spot today we have the Daikoku Seamount. This seamount is located in the Mariana Arc, about 325 meters or 1060 feet below sea level and it was found to be hydrothermally active in 2003. In 2014, it was discovered that the submarine volcano was either actively erupting or had been very recently. Along with these discoveries came the realization that this seamount also features a pool of liquid sulfur that was covered in some sort of black coating. This little sulfur cauldron is approximately 4.5 by 3 meters large and is 420 meters deep. There are rising gases like carbon dioxide and hydrogen that are coming out of the pool and they are moving that black crust that sits on top. The rising gases appear like smoke but underwater which is super cool. The really cool thing about this little sulfur lake is that it is almost an anomaly on earth and one of the few other sulfur lakes that are known is actually located on Jupiter's moon Io. While there have been a few other liquid sulfur lakes found on earth, the one located near this seamount is the most impressive one we have ever found on our planet. Mm -hmm. 